Hello and welcome to IC, Inside ICD Stuttgart, the first of a series of uh, insider sessions where we take a look at some of the leading doctoral research centers around the world. Um, before I uh, introduce Aki Mengis, who will be um, introducing the, the speakers, can I just make a few brief announcements? Um, first of all, uh, uh, tomorrow we have our, the next in the series of our doctoral consortium sessions on AI neuroscience and architecture, where Joschka Bach, who is himself from Germany, will be our guest. Joschka is one of the leading figures in the world of uh, neuroscience and AI. Uh, he's interested in the question of what we can find out about human intelligence through the lens of, through the lens of AI. Um, and this has been a very successful series. We are, uh, record, we are recording all the sessions and uploading them to our YouTube library. Last week, we had David Chalmers looking at uh, virtual worlds, for, uh, just talking about his new book, Reality Plus. We also have Antonio Damasio, um, Andy Clark, and several leading figures joining us in this session. I'd also like to mention that we have a, um, <clears throat> we, we just recently, we've launched a series of uh, language channels in uh, uh, Farsi and Arabic and, uh, and Spanish. Yesterday, we held another, our, our, sec, our third Farsi session, and we've also had some very successful Arabic sessions, the first of which uh, attracted over 20,000 views. At the bottom here, if you want to do a screen capture, you can cap you, there is the link to the, <clears throat> to, to the YouTube channel where we keep all these sessions, including this one and also the Sunday session from the Doctoral Consortium. So today, it gives me the great pleasure to, to, to welcome um, Aki Mengers um, and his team of doctoral researchers from ICD Stuttgart. Um, Aki himself almost needs no introduction. Um, in, I actually knew him initially as a student, so as a student of the AA. Since then, he's had a meteoric rise to fame and now um, leads probably what is the, one of the leading um, institutes for research in, in Stuttgart. Um, I can recall uh, way back then when he came to Los Angeles <clears throat> to run a workshop at USC, and Manuel Delanda was in, introduced to him and Manuel described him as, as uh, Fry Otto 2.0. I think that's very much the case. Um, I think what is so astonishing about uh, ICD Stuttgart is that they have, uh, uh, have, have, have designed and built a series of experimental prototype pavilions which are pushing the boundaries of what you can do with material behaviors and what you can do with technology in terms of fabrication, but also very concerned about environmental and sustainable issues as well. So I'm going to be handing over to, to Akim um, and uh, I will be here to, to address the questions at the end. Um, I'd like to thank Akim and also uh, ICD Stuttgart for being so supportive of digital futures in the past. And we have Tiffany Cheng here and Samuel Lida who were actually at our last in-person workshop um, in Shanghai. So welcome Akim and thank you very much for agreeing to, to uh, uh, introduce your doctoral research at ICD Stuttgart. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Neil. Let me just uh, share my screen. Um, so I hope you can see that now. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to introduce um, ICD. And uh, I particularly appreciate the format of um, having the opportunity to give a bit more of an inside view of how we work um, through the lens of a small number of um, in-depth presentations uh, by some of our researchers who will introduce in a second. So um, we are the Institute for Computation Design and Construction at the University of Stuttgart. And we are currently around 30 researchers, both on a doctoral and postdoctoral level. Um, we have been growing quite consistently since the Institute was founded in 2009. And also quite recently, we were really happy to um, have appointed our new colleague, Thomas Wortman, um, who is the um, tenure track professor in computing and architecture, um, who will help us strengthening the facet of um, uh, computer science oriented work with a particular focus on AI and um, machine learning. So um, I'm particularly happy um, that uh, today we have six out of those 30 researchers having the opportunity to present um, their work in a bit more depth. Um, that is uh, Tiffany, um, Sam, Yassi, Jakob, Christoph, and Niklas. 
Um, David introduced himself a little bit more in depth as part of their presentation, um, but I'm uh, very happy um, to have them here with me today to, to give you a, actually a very interesting, I think, insight also into the kind of broader range of work we do at ICD. I think it's important um, maybe to understand that ICD is situated in a larger ecosystem um, at the University of Stuttgart, um, which of course includes our MSc program ITEC, Integrative Technologies in Architectural Design Research. And actually three of the PhD candidates who will present their research later on are former ITEC graduates. Um, so I think uh, we're very happy to also see a lot of our uh, students move on to pursue a further academic career as researchers. Um, I think I may also take the opportunity to say that um, we are currently have the deadline for our next intake for fall 2022 coming up on the 15th of February. So if you like what you're going to see in the next two hours, you may want to consider approaching um, the um, application, even if it's a bit last minute now. Um, in addition, I think uh, we have um, had the great uh, possibility in 2019 to establish the Class of Excellence in CDC, Integrative Computation Design Construction. And this is in the context um, in which most of the research that you're going to see later on is actually developed. The Cluster of Excellence is a large scale research center that is founded by the German Research Foundation, uh, funded by the German Research Foundation, uh, and is the home to approximately 120 researchers from many different disciplines, including, of course, architecture and civil engineering, but also mechanical engineering, computer science, robotics and um, the humanities as well as social science. So it's a great interdisciplinary setting um, in which uh, a lot of the work that you're going to see is developed. Um, maybe just also uh, a quick look into where we work. Um, this is, for example, on our uh, computation construction laboratory, um, which we use to do a lot of the prototyping um, that Neil mentioned. So here we had actually for a few years now the opportunity to develop um, a lot of the work um, that um, I will show in a few minutes. Um, in addition, uh, and as part of the cluster of excellence, um, we now have a new uh, 3000 square meter facility, which allows us also to upscale um, both our ambitions, but also related robotic systems. Um, and this is uh, divided into an indoor laboratory that you can see here, as well as an outdoor laboratory, which is almost uh, like a, um, I would say, experimental building site, uh, where, for example, our colleagues um, use this tower grain as a kind of robotic uh, grain as a future construction equipment. Um, so, Having a bit situated uh, and established the context, who we are and um, where we work, um, probably the most important aspect is what we are actually interested in and what we are researching. So I may just take a few minutes to also introduce this. And of course, at the center of our interest is um, computation. And I think uh, a lot of our work is based on the hypothesis that um, digital technologies don't exist, let's say, in a historical continuum um, where we basically just augment what we have always done with digital technologies, um, but that, they, that digital technologies really have a kind of positive, disruptive potential that allows us to rethink um, the way how we intellectually and physically produce architecture on a kind of profound level. Um, the facet that interests, interests us particularly is the relationship between um, computation and materialization. Um, so we are really interested to explore um, the digital realm as a very intense interface to how we create and change the physical world. Um, and I think this has become um, particularly relevant 
uh, in the light of the actual materialization crisis we're facing as a discipline or almost as a society um, where we increasingly um, orient our work towards um, making a contribution uh, towards overcoming <clears throat> the ecological um, problem that goes hand in hand with the way we currently uh, construct our built environment. So um, this is a very genuine concern that is also at the heart of the cluster of excellence. And I think um, what we're trying to explore is how we do not necessarily just see that as an issue um, of uh, sustainability, but as a kind of cultural um, approach um, where we're trying to seek a kind of uh, established, we're trying to establish a novel material culture um, where I would say sustainability, um, effectiveness and efficiency goes together um, with a novel architectural expression um, that uh, makes them also a cultural contribution. Um, I think uh, for that, we are trying to activate uh, material as a very, let's say, um, active agent uh, in the design process. And of course, here we can tap into a great history at the University of Stuttgart. Um, this is Fry Otto um, doing experiments at his Institute for Lightweight Systems. Um, and I think uh, this is, uh, as Neil already mentioned in his introduction, um, always a great inspiration for us to further extend the work that has a legacy here for more than 40 or 50 years and see how we can um, extend that uh, in the context of digital technologies. Similarly to Fry Auto, um, we also look at inspiration um, in the realm of um, uh, living systems and biology. So I think in that uh, ambition to rethink how we design and construct um, our built environment, biology is a great model for lateral thinking and for rethinking, and because it offers a much higher level of integration of form, material, structure, performance, and environment um, than what we currently have in our domain. So um, one of the leading uh, methodologies that we pursue in order um, to achieve such a higher level of integration is what we now call the co-design of methods, that is design and engineering methods, fabrication and construction processes and building and material systems um, that then by actually informing methods, processes and systems concurrently uh, and establishing a related computation feedback give rise um, to that novel material culture that I mentioned before. And you may see that um, as, uh, uh, let's say, a continuum in the six presentations that will follow um, that in one way or another, um, the kind of notion of co-design is always present and the aim to establish a higher level of integration um, with the material systems and building systems that we work with. So we have explored this approach um, over the last decade in many different ways, how building material construction system fabrication process design methods and related biological models um, relate to each other. And um, I think as Neil mentioned, we have the opportunity to explore um, our research also on the level of actually literally building um, larger scale pavilions and research demonstrators such as the glass and carbon fiber roof that you see here um, that was located in the central courtyard of the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, which allowed us to showcase what it could actually mean to blur um, the building phase with the use phase of a super lightweight structure in one of the leading cultural institutions. Um, we had the fantastic opportunity um, to contribute to large scale pavilions to the Bundesgartenschau um, 2019 in Alpon. This is the timber pavilion that. Um, was also part of the work that Hans Jakob will show in a few minutes, um, as well as the fiber pavilion um, that is 
part of the research um, that Christoph will introduce. So um, I think there uh, is always, I would say, um, a real um, research insight in producing um, these uh, structures. Um, this is our project Maison Fibre at um, the Venice Biennale last year. Um, and maybe also just to complete the picture, um, the Obach Tower, actually a permanent research building that we um, constructed in Germany in 2019. Maybe um, just to wrap it up, I think this is not uh, the end of our ambition, let's say, to bring it uh, to the scale of building and try it out um, as a research demonstrator. But we're also very actively pursuing the possibilities where we can actually uh, land this research in actual construction um, in the world of uh, oh, as sometimes it's called the real world. I think research is also very real, so I'm not uh, particularly keen on this notion, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. This was our um, competition entry for the Baden Württemberg House for the Dubai Expo, where we unfortunately only got the second place, but this is another example where, for example, also Christoph contributed um, uh, very actively in the initial phase of a building with a glass and carbon fiber facade that will be completed actually this year. So for us, it's always important that um, the research eventually has a dimension um, that may have an impact um, on architecture um, and the actual um, built environment um, in its physical <clears throat> makeup. So with that, um, I think I'm now very much looking forward uh, to the presentation by um, our six PhD researchers. I think it's important also to say that um, they are all a bit at different points in their PhD research. Some have been around for several years. Some have actually started quite recently. Um, so this is, I think, a good um, insight also in terms of the, uh, let's say, cross-section of um, different stage, states of uh, development. And I think um, we'll kick it off with uh, Christoph Zechmeister now. So thanks a lot. Um, and we move on to Christoph. Okay, I think everybody should see my screen now. Yes, perfect. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, Achim. Um, I'm very happy to be here today and to have this opportunity to uh, showcase my work. Um, I will briefly introduce myself. My name is Christoph Zechmeister. Um, I'm a research associate at ICD at the University of Stuttgart. I'm originally trained as an architect, um, did my uh, master's of science at Vienna University of Technology. And uh, after that, I did uh, a postgraduate degree at ETH in Zurich. And I joined ICD a couple of years ago in 2018 as part of the research team on uh, fiber composites. And uh, my PhD is embedded into uh, the cluster of excellence in CDC and focuses on the co-design of robotic prefabrication systems and architectural fiber structures, basically looking at how those two domains intersect and can co-evolve. Um, to start off with, um, when we look at how fiber composites are usually created in the industry uh, at a large scale, it becomes immediately clear that those methods are not very well suited for uh, the construction industry. So large scale composite parts are primarily created uh, using fiber mats, which are amorphic by nature. So they need to be shaped, which is usually, usually done by a mold. And uh, the production of such a mold, especially on like a large scale or an architectural scale is very expensive. So this might be feasible for uh, industrial manufacturing for products where this mold can be reused many, many times. But for um, an architecture where we look at uh, morphologically differentiated uh, building parts, that would be very problematic. Um, but why would we even want to build with fiber composites to begin with? So fiber composites show very high potential for applications in architecture 
especially for large scale long span structures, if we consider their strength to weight ratio, so they are very strong, but they are very lightweight at the same time. And more on the material level, um, in contrast to the fiber mats I mentioned before, what we see here pictured on the screen are fiber rovings. And they're basically parallel strands of uh, thin fibers. And this means that this material has different properties in different directions, so they are anisotropic. And we can leverage this, um, this property and we can create controlled anisotropic fiber arrangements. So we can match the stiffness and the strength of the composite to the direction and the magnitude of the occurring loads in our structures. And that gives us a lot of control over the material amount in specific areas and allows us to basically heavily customize our structures depending on actual needs, which ultimately makes them extremely material efficient. And if we consider the fact that construction is actually one of the most environmentally uh, detrimental human activities, then being material efficient becomes uh, a very important factor for uh, sustainability. And uh, how can we leverage those potentials of, of fiber composites for large scale architectural structures? We can do that by rethinking how we produce composite structures. And um, what ICD has been developing for a few years now is basically a new type of filament binding. So an additive manufacturing process that uh, almost entirely mitigates all of the form work and only relies on minimal winding frames. And the fibers span freely in space between those boundary frames and the shape of the actual composite surface emerges only from the interaction between those fibers. So we can see such a prefabrication setup uh, here. This is how it looks like in real life. That's uh, from the Buga Fiber Pavilion that I will uh, introduce a bit later. So what we have here <clears throat> are winding frames. They position anchor points in space. We have a six axis robot arm, which uh, moves the end effector and keeps the fibers under tension throughout the winding process. We have the end effector itself uh, mounted to the flange of the robot, which guides uh, the fiber rovings and deposits them. And we have the anchor points, which uh, interface, which create the interface between fiber rovings and winding frame. So this is uh, the setup in action. Uh, the fibers are pulled off creels through a resin bath, and then they are hooked by the robot around uh, anchor points. The robot keeps traveling back and forth between those two extreme ends of the components. And it does that until uh, the necessary thickness of the composite surface is built up and the shape emerges from the reciprocal interaction of those fibers. And in order to achieve the maximum material efficiency, we can customize the fiber layer of a composite part and we can break it down into layers. And each layer caters to a specific requirement of the component. And uh, this is a configuration that provides the designer with uh, a very flexible tool to respond specifically to local requirements. And each fiber layer is defined by its anchor point sequence, which basically denotes the order in which the robot connects the anchor points. That's what we call the fiber syntax. And of course, fabrication and design of a composite component is only part of a bigger picture. Um, we also need to consider our engineering methods, our construction processes, our building and material systems at the same time, which is what we uh, call uh, co-design as a method. I can briefly introduced it before. And this essentially is a new kind of cyclical collaboration, which very much stands in contrast to um, linear process chains, um, oftentimes prevalent in design and construction practice. And in the end, this concurrent and interactive design approach allows us to exploit the full potential of both the material and of computation. And it enables us to complete those large scale architectural composite structures on time and on budget. We recently attempted to push this method further by creating a computational co-design framework based on a central data model, which um, allows us uh, to interactively and simultaneously collaborate across different domains and different disciplines. We conducted a comprehensive case study to test um, and to prove that our methods work. We fabricated test pieces and um, this will be um, 
This is summarized in the publication that will be coming out in the Journal of Computational Design and Engineering very soon. And what co-design enables us to do is uh, to, to complete large scale long span structures, just like this project, which is the 2019 Google Faber Pavilion. And like most of our demonstrators, this project was a collaboration between ICD and ITKE. Uh, in this case, the Bundesgartenschau in Heilbronn was a client and we had an industry partner, uh, Fiber, who is offering coreless filament winding uh, commercially and they took care of the final production of the fiber components. So we did the fabrication prototyping and developing, and they did the serial production of the components. And the dome structure has a span of 23 meters and a surface weight of only 7.6 kilogram per square meters. And that is facilitated by the high amount of customization and adaptivity that each of those fiber components exhibits. So we've seen uh, the potential of composite structures for long span applications in the last project, but can we also expand this idea of uh, robotically manufactured fiber composites towards an inhabitable multi-story building system? And we can see a diagram of such a structure here where we developed uh, a modular composite wall and slab building system uh, using a very compact fabrication setup and if you take reference from a formative model of architectural history from uh, Le Corbusier's Maison Domino, and we compare it to uh, a corresponding fiber composite part, we will see that we can actually significantly save on weight um, compared to a concrete slab. So with concrete, we have to accept all kinds of redundancies uh, in like a conventional way of, uh, of making it. Um, Whereas in the fiber slab, we can really focus our material effort on structurally critical areas. And we end up with a structure that is uh, much lighter, almost 50 times lighter than uh, a corresponding uh, concrete slab would be. And the robotic prefabrication uh, can be done with a fairly simple and compact setup based on a six axis robot arm and a turntable. The whole production setup uh, would fit the standard shipping container could be moved on site as kind of a mobile factory, could carry out uh, production there, but also could expand or convert uh, existing structures as kind of the future perspective. Uh, the size of the elements comply with conventional shipping standards. They can be manhandled easily. They can be put on the boat and transported. And um, this was the result of the project, a modular multi-story composite slab and wall system that we exhibited at the Venice Architecture Biennale last year. The project, again, was a collaboration between ICD, ITK, and Fiber as an industry partner. And uh, the structure is an inhabitable structure on uh, two levels, comprised of 30 load-bearing fiber components, 20 slabs, and uh, 10 wall components. And it showcases a material culture of dematerialization based on uh, a digital construction method that leverages this potential of highly anisotropic materials. So we talked about robotic prefabrication as a means to uh, efficiently produce uh, locally differentiated composite structures, but we can also look at this uh, like from a different angle and try to use robotic prefabrication as a generator, as a catalyst to expand the morphological and fiber simplex solution space. And that's what we do by uh, developing new modular and reconfigurable prefabrication platforms in the course of a multidisciplinary research project embedded in the INCDC cluster of excellence in collaboration with mechanical engineers and aircraft designers. And those new fabrication platforms, they are based on the use of robot teams which basically will allow us to uh, produce novel component typologies and novel fiber layups. We're developing bespoke tools to enable efficient and sustainable manufacturing. And we're investigating different kinds of dual robot uh, collaboration strategies for those robot teams to either work simultaneously in shared workspaces, as we can see here, where two robots share the workload of finding a test piece so in this case, this cuts the production time in half, but it also allows for more flexibility in the definition of the anchor point sequence and uh, expands the fiber syntax solution space. Um, 
We are also looking into, um, into the use of alternative material systems and natural fibers have recently gained uh, significance as a sustainable alternative to carbon and glass fibers. As a building material, they do hardly exist, however. And uh, if you go back again to the fact that construction is uh, environmentally problematic, then it becomes clear that uh, we also need to look for alternatives in terms of uh, materials. And uh, that's exactly what natural fibers, or in this case, flax fibers provide. And we started to incorporate those into our coalesce filament binding process. Um, we looked at different fiber and matrix combinations and their characteristics. So the performance and material characteristics of uh, flax fibers are very different than those of carbon. And uh, of course, it has an impact on what we can do with it. Uh, it has an impact on how we fabricate them and, uh, and, and also on our design solution space. And um, we recently um, completed the first implementation of this new alternative material system on an architectural scale. This is the Livmatz Pavilion in Freiburg, which, um, which was done as a, a research pavilion together with students and in collaboration with uh, another cluster of excellence, uh, the University of Freiburg. Um, here we have a load bearing structure of uh, 15 flax fiber components, which are robotically prefabricated. Um, the elements vary between 4.5 to 5.5 meters and are around 105 kilos on average. Again, those elements were uh, material production was being taken over by our industry partner Fiber. And uh, this was a very promising first implementation of uh, natural fibers in coalesce filament winding. And as we're now entering the second phase of our research project uh, in the uh, excellence cluster, we made the compatibility of the fabrication equipment with alternative materials a key part of it. So we also learned that uh, we cannot directly transfer previous knowledge of like more petrochemical materials directly onto alternative materials, but we rather have to um, develop new approaches to design and manufacture with those natural fiber composites, with, which I think is a very interesting perspective. Um, with this, I come to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you all for your time and I'm looking forward to this discussion later. Okay, I think the next presentation is by Yazi. Um, I keep I keep it very the, the transition is very short. Maybe you could directly hand over because I think we are running a bit uh, late. So Yazi, right. are you ready to start immediately? Perfect. Yes. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is uh, Yasa Mantahoni, and I'm going to present my uh, doctoral research uh, program in shape change. To tell you a bit about my background, um, I studied my Bachelor of Science in Architecture at the University of Tehran in Iran. Then I moved to Boston and I got my dual master's degree in architecture and in computer science at MIT. And I've been working as a research associate and a PhD candidate at the ICD since 2018. At ICD, I work at the material programming group closely with Dylan Wood and Tiffany Cheng, who uh, will also present um, in a few minutes after me. My research is about designing and fabricating structures that change their shape in response to environmental stimuli. These structures do not rely on any electromechanical sensors or actuators, nor does their shape change require any external energy. Instead, it is solely relying on the material properties and material intelligence itself. My research is highly inspired by nature, specifically by passively actuated hygroscopic plant structures. Great example of those are the pine, cone, the pine cones. When a pine cone is on, on a tree, the scales of a cone is closed to protect the seeds. But when the right time comes, the cones fall from the tree. And as they dry out, 
the scales bend upwards to release the seeds. The interesting thing is if, if you take the pine cone and put it back in water or in high humidity, the scales close again. And this opening and closing process can repeat for thousands of time. And the whole process, this whole shape change is completely passive and it does not require any uh, metabolic energy from the plant. So these features such as responsiveness and adaptiveness through shape change that we can see in nature is highly relevant to us as architects. For example, we can use this type of mechanisms in uh, creating weather responsive and adaptive uh, architectural building skins. One example was best shown in the Hyperskin Pavilion built in 2013 by Achim and the San City. With increasing demand for energy efficiency in the built environment, this type of adaptive uh, building schemes and facade systems just become increasingly more relevant. Another area that such, such shape changing and self shaping systems can be useful is in developing self shaping and self assembling manufacturing processes. Here, the idea is that the shaping of, of uh, an object of a structure can be embedded within the material itself instead of relying on uh, external um, fabrication or assembly machines such as these robotics or but how can we do that so we can look at the nature like the pine cone the pine cone can achieve its passive shape change through using both inherent material properties at the micro scale and also hierarchical structuring of material in different length scales. Cellulose microfibrils are inherently hygroscopic, meaning that they can swell when they absorb water or, or humidity from the environment. And then through the anisotropic arrangement of these microfibrils and also through the binary structuring of the fibrils and different layers of structure in the pine cone, this volumetric shape change, get this volumetric expansion gets translated into shape change in form of bending. Well, my hypothesis is that we, if we can uh, follow the same path and if we can co-design the three aspects of material, music structure, and mechanisms, we can create highly functional uh, uh, shape changing and adaptive structures. By material, we mean materials that have this inherent stimuli responsive property, here specifically a uh, hygro hygroscopic property. The mesostructuring is structuring the internal uh, properties and structuring of the material through which uh, the shape change can be physically programmed. And the mechanisms are the motion uh, mechanisms and systems, the overall systems that provide uh, the function. And the last two can be precisely designed and fabricated through integrative computational design and digital fabrication processes. Specifically in my research, I work on 4D printing, which is 3D printing with stimuli responsive and shape changing materials. I use a normal desktop FDM 3D printers and as materials, I use either commercial wood filled filaments or customized cellulose filled filaments. And this content of cellulose or wood uh, gives the material their, their hygroscopic property. Well, while the hardware that we use is relatively uh, generic, we design the software and computational fabrication processes uh, based on different processes and needs. A typical workflow starts with designing the MISO structures it has a step of simulation and prediction of shapes when designing shape changing structures. And lastly, it contains automatic design of the 3D printing tool paths and generating the G code, which is then directly used on an FDM desktop 3D printer to produce shape changing structures. So next I will show three studies, each of them mostly focused on one of these aspects that I introduced. The first study is focused on materials. Here, this research project was uh, undertaken with our collaborators from the Institute for Plastics Technology at the University of Stuttgart. 
And in this project, we look at how we can design and customize materials specifically for 4D printing. So here we used cellulose as the basic hygroscopic element, and we used bioplastics. And then by combining them, we created biocomposites that are mm, responsive. And since we could uh, add different contents of the cellulose and also we could use different matrix polymers, we could then produce a matrix of polymer, a matrix of filaments that had different stiffness, some of them being flexible, some of them being stiff, and also had different uh, cellulose content, which made them more or less responsive. And then we use these materials to create humidity responsive shape changing structures, as you show in this video. And since we are using 3D printing, and since the, especially SDM 3D printing allows us to really design the material structuring by simply changing uh, the toolpath design and the mesostructural design, we can program shape change in different elements. Uh, we can create uh, bending with different direction, different orientation and different bending curvatures, uh, all embedded just inside the material structure itself. Here is a publication that you can refer to if you'd like to know more of this project. There's also an upcoming paper, which hopefully will be published uh, in the next couple of months. In the second study, we were focused on the mesostructure. And here the aim was to program sequential and multi-stage motion. This project was in collaboration with the Planned Biomechanics Group at the University of Freiburg, Institute for Microsystems Technology from Uni Freiburg, and the Institute for Structural Mechanics. So here we looked at this, uh, the silver thistle, this plant that is hygroscopic. And when it rains, it closes these, uh, the thistles. But the interesting thing is that all thistles do not bend, they do not change at the same time, but they change their shape sequentially. And through the sequential motion, they avoid collision with each other. So then our aim was to be able to create the same, uh, same process in our artificial structures. And the way to do it was through using, uh, through designing the mesostructures. Here we picked uh, some printing parameters, such as the thickness and the porosity in different layers of the functional bilayer, and we studied their effect on the time scale of shape change. And we used these results to create structures which different areas bend at different times sequentially, such as seen in this, um, in this aperture example. And then further on, we used if utilize this programming of sequential motion to create self-locking structure as a demonstrator to show how both the kinetic and also the time scale of shape change um, can be programmed at the same time to create a complex uh, mechanism, such as the locking mechanism. And here are the related publications if you would like to see further. And lastly, we studied uh, how we can use now this bending to create more complex and intricate motion mechanisms. Specifically here, we studied curve folding structures and we developed the concept of self-shaping curve folding. So the self-shaping curve folding utilizes the basic uh, geometric property of curved folding which combines bending on the surfaces with folding uh, on the hinges. Here, instead of activating the hinges, we distribute the actuation on the, on the curve crease uh, origami faces. And through this, we achieve a large motion amplification effect. Here, what you see are the two structures with the same material, same mesostructural properties, one using the curve fold and one using the simple bending. And you see that the curve fold is able to create much larger opening compared to a simple bending structure. Here's a look 
at the mesoscale structuring uh, of these uh, self-shaping curve foldings and how different layers with different materials are printed on top of each other. And here is a look of how we can physically program the fold angle in these structures using either geometric properties, such as the curvature of the crease line, or two path design parameters. And then through this programming, we can uh, create structures with highly um, differentiated um, folding and bending in different areas. And we don't stop here, actually. Now that we have this, uh, this whole system, we can go to even more complex patterns. We can, for example, create tessellated uh, folded structures that self-shape just on their own, just upon changing in their moisture content. Here, specifically with this material, upon uh, wetting for half an hour and then drying in the room uh, conditions. And I just want to take a moment and compare what you see here in the structure to more conventional methods of uh, folding, which is either in paper folding by hand or using robots or machinery and um, how we can, how much we can simplify this whole uh, assembly and shaping processes through uh, using material intelligence. And then here is just a look at the structural performance of some of these small super lightweight structures. For example, you see on the left-hand side that structure with like eight grams of weight and one millimeter of thickness can take more than 600 uh, grams of weight. And here is the publication that you can look at to further learn about this project. To recap, I showed how co-designing materials, mesostructures, and mechanisms can lead us to create adaptive and shape-changing structures. We showed how materials, how bio-based materials can be customized and can be designed specifically for creating uh, smart morphing structures, how the mesostructures can be designed and fabricated to physically program the shape change, both spatially and temporally, and how novel mechanisms can be developed for uh, functions such as motion amplification. Hopefully, through this um, integrative approach, we can create, we can reach the same level of uh, intricacy and multifunctionality that the natural organisms have achieved. And this can help us to create more uh, responsive, adaptive, and sustainable for the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Yazi. And I think we directly move on to Jakob. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Great. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is uh, hans Jakob Wagner, and I'm really honored to talk to you um, here in this uh, forum about uh, my PhD research, um, which has the, uh, the, the title and the topic of uh, project-based robotic timber construction. Um, my um, background is I studied at the Technical University of Vienna, actually very similar to uh, Christoph Zechmeister, and, um, and then did my master's here at the University of Stuttgart in the ITEC master program. And since, since 2017, I'm uh, at the ICD. Um, which is headed by Professor Achim Menges. And my focus is advanced computational wood architecture and uh, associated robotic production systems and processes. Um, when I started uh, my research at the ICD, um, the Institute was already known for many projects that exemplified the great potentials of integrative design uh, with wood. Uh, using computational design methods and robotic fabrication. Um, nevertheless, um, these technologies um, certainly didn't really reach the industry yet. And 
even the most uh, advanced uh, projects that we see uh, don't integrate um, most of the technologies that we're talking about in academia. Um, and the hypothesis of my research is that this is not only because it just takes time to transfer technologies into industry, but also because existing fabrication technologies um, are too inflexible and um, there is no real concept of how this kind of inflexibility should actually be overcome uh, with uh, robotic fabrication. Um, as a kind of uh, example, we can really see how the most advanced uh, startups and young companies that are today delving into the computational uh, wood architecture um, field um, really in some way just use different headlines uh, for what they're doing. Um, and in, in some way, it's really just a repetition of what we tried to do already within the 20th century. Um, as, a, as an addition to this kind of problem, we can also um, uh, see that uh, actually uh, the notion of modular construction, which is another kind of trend within this field, is really only applicable to a fraction of the, um, of the um, building construction industry. It's around 12%. And really for the rest of the project, we don't really have an idea of how, how we should actually automate and uh, robotically fabricate uh, these buildings. Um, and in my research, I'm trying to um, see how we can make uh, robotic fabrication more flexible um, and how we can also make the computational design uh, methods more flexible so that we can actually apply them on a project-based uh, uh, manner. And um, as a kind of byproduct, uh, this research then also tries to um, postulate a framework where we can actually achieve integrative coevolution, meaning that over time we can continuously integrate our building system developments and the automation systems development within the context of uh, timber construction industry. Now, um, in my research, I'm developing a mostly modular robotic fabrication systems uh, that aim uh, for constant reconfiguration. And as a first example for this, um, we built a TIM platform, which is a flexible robotic timber construction platform, which is actually quite simple. It's just sitting on a container, meaning that it's, it can be shipped around uh, the world if need be. Um, it looks like that. Uh, we published also a paper that you can see on the left side. Uh, if you if you want to read up on the on the nitty gritty details, um, but essentially it's just a, a really a, um, a compact uh, robotic fabrication system that you can then bring to a construction company and have it unfold and then integrate into the existing uh, fabrication space um, and then it's able to locally produce um, um, uh, specific building projects uh, with highly specialized uh, machinery. Um, with this platform, I'm uh, in the course of my research, um, trying to prove that it, it really can produce a different kind of building systems. Um, I'm involved in three different projects. Some of them are already finished. Some of them are ongoing. And really, um, I think the, what you can see on the screen is that there's not really a similarity between those three projects from a tectonic point of view, um, but still they're actually um, completed with uh, very similar um, computational design tools, but also basically the same robotic fabrication unit. Um, and the first project that I want to talk about today is the, is the Booger Wood Pavilion. Um, Achim already showed um, a quick uh, teaser of that. Um, it's a very big uh, interdisciplinary and uh, uh, interdisciplinary demonstrator building uh, that we built in, in the year 2019. There was a lot of people involved um, and I was mostly uh, responsible for the robotic fabrication and the integration 
uh, of the design to the to the fabrication um, uh, logics. Um, that brings me to the notion of co-design. Um, also, Christoph mentioned this already, which really is the idea of bringing together different aspects of design um, in order to develop a building system that integrates, in, in my case, most of the uh, design methods and the fabrication processes. Um, on, a bigger, uh, on a bigger picture, for me, this means that actually we're moving from closed system computational design, meaning uh, closed algorithms that that have the idea that you can that you can generate uh, buildings with with the course of a click. Um, we're moving from that towards open and interactive computational design, where you can actually um, where you postulate a certain kind of interaction between the human and the computer and the human and the automation systems. Um, the Buga Wood Pavilion um, is basically an event space with a flexible use, and it spans 30 meters across this kind of uh, flexible event area uh, with a minimal use of material. And the way that this is possible is that we uh, built this pavilion not from uh, solid uh, plate segments, but we split the segments into half and built a uh, hollow cassettes out of them, meaning that with the same amount of material, we actually uh, achieve a higher um, structural height of the plate, which makes the um, pavilion much more uh, structurally efficient. Um, this is how one of those cassettes looks like in three dimensions. Um, you can see it has a top plate and a bottom plate, um, and it has a ring of uh, edge beams that are glued within those two plates. Um, but what is important here is that, of course, um, splitting this uh, segment into a cassette uh, drastically increases the complexity of this pavilion. Um, in total, we had 376 cassettes that were all of unique shapes. Um, and around 2,000 uh, beams that were also um, all specific to their uh, location. And this, of course, if you go to a construction company and you postulate that uh, this should be something that should be built, um, they're, they're going to either say that this is impossible to achieve or they're going to say it's going to cost like a, a ridiculous amount of money. Um, but um, by integrating the computational design model directly to the robotic fabrication um, processes, uh, we were in this project able to really directly uh, transfer all the data that is uh, contained within the model to the uh, materialization. And by that, uh, we avoid any miscommunication between um, the fabrication and the design model and at the same time, automate the whole process. Um, the project was then assembled on site uh, fairly conventionally, except that it was uh, done within a, a cantilevering construction method. So there was no form work necessary. And, um, and of course, we were very happy um, of, the, of the final result. Um, now, uh, the, the second project that I want to um, talk about today, because the time is limited, is the multi-story timber uh, project that we're currently in the process of uh, um, erecting. Um, and this is happening in the context of the Class of Excellence, uh, where I'm involved in two projects, the RP3 and RP4. So that's the design of a multi-story building system and the cyber-physical uh, robotic fabrication platform for timber structures. Um, and within all the story timber structures, we, we have a, um, there is a lot of potentials, but there is also one very big problem, at least uh, in the way that we see it, um, namely that uh, timber structures by their nature are unidirectional. So you normally have a plate that is also rectangular and it spans in one direction. And if you compare that to concrete structures, uh, which can be poured into any shape and can be re reinforced by a rebar uh, steel uh, in any direction, 
um, timber um, slab systems definitely are not yet um, um, competitive with all uh, construction projects. They can be, of course, very efficient in certain typologies, but at the moment, uh, there is really a lot of research to be done of how we can achieve the same spatial qualities and flexible design um, possibilities uh, with timber structures. Um, and currently, we're, we're really stuck to this kind of typology, um, which works uh, quite well for student housing, but uh, for other um, building projects, it's not so well suited. Um, so then along these lines, we tried to um, develop uh, a couple of ideas of how we can actually achieve um, better uh, timber slabs with, with light weight and uh, very efficient material use and really go away from this kind of unidirectional notion um, to multidirectional systems that can be um, locally um, differentiated in their material makeup and their fiber direction. And as a kind of first demonstrator, we're currently um, designing and, uh, and fabricating um, a small 60 square meter multi-story timber pavilion, which is basically the minimum uh, the mi minimum viable product to demonstrate the multi-directional system as it has like three columns, meaning that there is already three direction with three directions within the slab that the system needs to um, uh, perform in. And it also demonstrates a rather large span of eight meters. Um, as I said, all the materials are tightly um, designed according to the, uh, to the structural force flow, where we can specifically place uh, timber beams and timber material with the fiber direction according to the structural model. And at the same time, we're extending the team platform with a, a larger working table so that we can actually robotically produce those uh, slab elements um, rather efficiently. Um, this process is uh, currently on the way. Um, we're also integrating uh, augmented reality systems into this kind of fabrication process. Um, and we also are still using the gluing um, technologies that we were mostly, de mostly developing for the Huga Wood Pavilion. Um, and with this project, I hope to wrap up my research uh, on the integration of robotic fabrication and computational design um, rather soon. And I'm hoping that the tools and methods that I'm working on could potentially have a sustainable impact on the industry, where I hope to provide a productive uh, conceptual framework uh, for industrial organization in architecture and construction that integrates all the novel technologies that we're working uh, with already in academia. And uh, this might finally allow the constant integration of building and automation systems, even if they're continuously advancing over time. Um, with this, um, I would like to wrap up this presentation and uh, thanks to all your attentions. Thanks, uh, Jakob. Um, I think this was a very interesting insight into the research we're doing um, in regards to timber construction at ICD. And I think we now have Sam showing a radically different way of how you could also um, uh, consider robotics. And um, I think the floor is yours, Sam. OK, great. Um, hi, everyone out there. Um, my name is Sam, and I'm also very excited to be here and share a bit about my doctoral research. Uh, so, as my colleagues did, I will start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm originally from the US, where I received bachelor's degrees in both architecture and engineering. And um, after working for a year in Munich, I came to Stuttgart to do the ITEC master's program, similar to Jakob and Nicholas, who will come later. And, um, I am now staying at the ICD to work on my PhD. Um, and I am part of the distributed robotics team together with Nicholas, um, 
who will come shortly. So uh, diving into the research, I thought I should clarify what distributed robotics actually means. And in order to do that, I would refer to these robots because they are similar to the ones that I'm interested in. They are mobile machines, which are relatively small, fairly cheap, easily transportable, and able to move in their environments. And as the technology for deploying such machines is becoming more advanced, mobile robots are beginning to revolutionize our everyday lives. So like the examples that you see on the screen. Um, and the collection of such machines into distributed robotic systems further increases their flexibility, fault tolerance, and ability to accomplish complex tasks. Therefore, research has begun to explore how distributed robotic systems composed of numerous mobile robots can build architectural structures on construction sites. These systems further have the potential to break uh, break current conventions of construction automation and their ability to adapt to spe site-specific conditions, uh, respond to different architectural use cases on the fly, and work potentially at unlimited scales. However, the majority of research to date has been conducted from an engineering perspective, often leading to the assembly of simple structures of non-conventional building materials with little attention to real uh, architectural construction constraints, such as material connections. Therefore, my research is interested in the development of distributed robotic systems from a construction, uh, for construction from an architectural perspective. My aim is to break current conventions in architecture and construction in order to introduce robotic systems which inhabit the, in the structure, giving them the ability to assemble disassemble, maintain, and adapt the structure they live in. Tackling this goal has largely le led to the development of the system that you see on the screen. This distributed robotic system is composed of linear timber struts and robotic actuators, which have the ability to rotate, grip, and communicate. Using these abilities, the actuators can combine with timber struts to form modular robot kinematic uh, robot material kinematic chains that can reconfigure throughout the construction process. Kinematic chains are similar to industrial robotic arms, which you saw in some of the previous presentations, but can break apart or rearrange during the construction process to form chains with varying degrees of freedom. In essence, the robots leverage the building material for construction, as well as part of the body of the robotic hardware for locomotion and material manipulation. The collection of arrangements or rearrangements of the entire system allow for the autonomous creation of complex timber assemblies as seen in the videos on the screen. Initial explorations of this began in the context of the iTech master's course, uh, which Achim introduced earlier uh, at the University of Stuttgart by myself together with Ramon Weber using custom 3D printed parts and off-the-shelf electronics for the robotic actuator and a 28 by 28 millimeter strut. In order to showcase the system, the first demonstrations were focused on the most basic construction capability of the system, building structures in a single plane. In order to do this, the assembly process can be broken down into three tasks or building primitives. Okay. Uh, in order, uh, which is locomotion, dynamic kinematic chaining, and transportation. The details of e each I will quickly explain in the next slides. The task of locomotion involves a kinematic chain composed of two robotic actuators and one timber strut. It is the action of bringing a kinematic chain from one location to another across a bed of fixed struts. Dynamic kinematic chaining introduces the dynamic nature of the system that is inherent to its modularity. For this task, the timber strut between robotic actuators is not fixed, but rather changes throughout the process. In the video, the four robotic actuators work together with one additional timber strut and in turn create different typologies of kinematic chains as they pass the strut in between each other. Transportation is the final assembly task and involves the transportation and placement of a timber strut. Four robots and two timber struts collaborate in order to transport a strut from one location to another. The combination of these tasks comprise a set of building primitives that be can be combined in order to build architectural artifacts like the one that you see on the screen. We can further imagine teams of robots working in parallel yet in different planes to assemble 
uh, a single structure. The specifics for the planning uh, of the construction, Nicholas will probably give a bit more insight in his presentation. In dealing with the connection between timber struts, we developed a drilling of end effector, which would allow a kinematic chain to screw timber struts together. The end effector consists of a custom drill fixture around an automatic screw feeder, which would allow for the robotic actuators to hold multiple screws, enabling it to perform multiple connections. The project has now transitioned to being part of the larger research network that Aachen introduced earlier, the NCDC, uh, two other institutes, Max Planck, Max Planck's Physical Intelligence Department and the Technical University of Berlin's Learning and Intelligence Lab has joined us to work on the project, which is now known as RP19 or Research Project 19. We are currently using the NCDC research approach of co-design, which you've heard a bit about, in order to further co-develop and co-optimize the distributed robotic system. The expertise of the other institutes of mechatronics design and machine learning and task and motion planning are helping to make the system currently more robust. My specific interest in the RP19 is in design methods and interfaces for designing and potentially rearranging architectural structures built by distributed robotic systems. My aim is to evaluate different design processes in, afforded by such uh, robotic systems. This includes both top-down methods in which designers develop group blueprints for the robots to construct, as well as bottom-up methods in which designs emerge through the construction process and are potentially derived from the distributed intelligence of the robots themselves. Currently, I'm focused on the creation of agent-based models using the in-house developed ICD agent-based modeling framework with different agent definitions. This investigation has led to questions of uh, what level of control a designer should have of the resulting structure, how can design intent be expressed to the robotic actuators, and at what phases of the construction process does a designer need to be involved. Together with my collaborators in Research Project 19, we are also working on interfaces, which would allow design methods to communicate with the other parts of the project specifically those for the robotic hardware and methods for task and motion planning. These interfaces uh, specifically allow us to design, plan, communicate instructions and monitor construction processes. This comes back to the ambition of the work in which the design, planning, construction and occupation phases of a building are all collapsed into one. By developing such interfaces, in native architectural design software, we hope to lower the entry-level knowledge required for potentially working with such systems in the future. So in zooming back out, distributed robotics is one approach of the many approaches to construction automation. Each uh, approach provides a unique opportunity for the creation of safer, more efficient, and sustainable construction. Some of these approaches are already being integrated into practice leading to higher levels of productivity in the building sector. Distribu distributed robotic systems, however, need further research in order to continue to be proven viable. My research continues on this mission and conceptualizes a construction paradigm where real architectural structures can be robotically built or changed adaptively with teams of small uh, mobile machines. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, I think we'll see a bit more work on distributed robotics uh, by Nicholas' presentation. But before that, um, we will have Tiffany presenting her work on 4D printing and material programming. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. And um, I just want to say that I'm very excited to be presenting my doctoral research on material programming for 4D printing. So first, uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Tiffany and I'm a computational designer from Taiwan. Um, I joined uh, ICD here in Stuttgart, Germany four years ago. But before that, I had spent three years in Cambridge, Massachusetts where I earned my master's degree in design technologies from Harvard University. And prior to that, I was at USC for five years uh, for my bachelor's of architecture. 
And now here at the ICD, I work in the material programming research group uh, with Yassi, who presented earlier. And my um, uh, research focus uh, investigates how we can use 4D printing for design and um, structuring of a material. Uh, and this is because we want to encode movement and functionality, uh, such as uh, material uh, functional radiation and mechanical properties using moisture as the stimulus to create shape change. And in this endeavor, I'm very much inspired by nature, like many of my colleagues. And uh, many materials found in nature through their differentiated but integrated material structuring are often able to adapt to their surroundings by performing the combined tasks of sensing, computing, and actuation. And they do so completely passively and autonomously, that is without using any energy at all. And so my aim is to transfer this integrated functionality of, um, of these natural materials that we find in nature, whether that is uh, from the pine cone that we just saw or new unexplored biological role models to technical systems across different application domains, including architecture, engineering, and construction. So during the course of my PhD, I've had the incredible pleasure to collaborate with renowned researchers from parallel disciplines. And in the context of um, the 4D Multimats project, I, I was able to work with plant biomechanics, material scientists, and medical specialists from Freiburg University. And uh, with this goal of transferring biological principles to 4D printing through computation design, um, we saw that with extrusion-based 3D printing processes like these film and fabrication, um, the process inherently creates anisotropic structures through the paths of material deposition. So the first task for us was to formalize the design and modeling method for controlling the internal structure of 4D printed objects, um, such that we can choreograph and control the 3D printer's extrusion sequence and deposit a combination of materials along specific trajectories. So first, we developed a hierarchical and user-friendly workflow for prescribing the 4D printing um, process parameters of a multi-material and multi-layered surface in order to program different bending behaviors, such as bending with convex constant curvature here, or concave and variable bending in the diagonal direction. So this computational workflow allowed us to quickly and easily customize the structure and fabricate surfaces with different degrees of bending and even combine different bending behaviors within one surface structure, as you can see here. And besides self-shaping, um, we also know that the printing pattern also plays a big role in the resulting mechanical properties. Through the design of the geometry, um, we can even modulate those properties properties in specific directions, uh, such as flexibility and stiffness and even um, auxetic behaviors. So um, with this hierarchical workflow, um, it made it possible for us to aggregate simple building blocks together to form a greater whole. And, um, and it allowed us to create very complex material structures like what you see here in the zoomed in photo um, quite easily. And this is especially useful um, as a showcase um, here uh, for orthotic devices and other wearable systems that have to interface with the body, since there is a need for both customization and adaptation for specific um, patient pathologies in the case of um, assistive wearable devices. So here we uh, use material programming to demonstrate the potential of 4D printing in the design of an orthotic splint that integrates uh, these various functions um, in shape, properties, and textures together. And here you can see the multifunctionality of such a system being expressed with all of the parts uh, combined in the surface and the intricate material structuring um, and textures in a close view, the adaptively changing um, uh, shapes uh, areas of shape change, as well as the directional qualities and stiffness and flexibility that is required in a, um, in a splint. So now that we have this um, uh, computational design workflow, what, what can you do with this? So 
We see that in nature, um, uh, many organisms have evolved some really ingenious strategies for adaptations. And um, here you can see, for example, um, a climbing plant that can generate high squeezing forces on their, on their host structure through this incredible ability that it has to tension itself. And it does this by expanding the stipules that are located at the base of the leaves. So we uh, sought to abstract and transfer this self-tensioning and self-tightening ability to 4D printing. And um, we did this through a combination of two different mechanisms, which not only have uh, um, different program behaviors, but that also operate in two different phases. Um, so the force generating mechanism is actually a combination of five different components, which are stack, stacked on top of each other and, uh, and actuate uh, separately as well as, as sequentially. And here you can see the 4D printed mechanism cell shaping around its support structure. Uh, and we, we also envision how this workflow and this um, system might be used by non-experts in digital modeling. So, um, here we envision a process in which signs can be physically prototyped directly on the body, 3D scanned and digitally analyzed to generate the fabrication data for 4D printing. And then uh, is allowed to self-shape into the desired um, uh, and designed geometry. So this is the result of the splint design with the self-tightening mechanism that wraps around the wrist and forearm at varying curvatures. But uh, we have also measured the squeezing forces of our 4D printed mechanism, and we found that we were able to generate the same range of forces as the original plant row model when we mimicked the, the um, stipules in low quantities, which is how they are found in nature. But when we, in fact, increased the number of these stipules, we were actually able to measure higher forces as a result. And so it was quite exciting to see that after studying and understanding um, biology, uh, computational design allowed us to extend beyond what is found in nature. But ultimately, as architects and engineers at the ICD, we're interested in building some construction. So, um, so my next research question is whether or not we can achieve this bio-inspired um, structuring at large scale. And this is something that was in fact explored in my workshop with Dylan Wood at Digital Futures back in 2018. So um, wood is a high performance construction material. Um, and as you may have seen in Atkins' introduction, it is also responsive, scalable, and easy to build volume with. On the other hand, 3D printing, as I've shown, um, can produce a high resolution of detail in customizing physical properties. Therefore, this project proposes a hybrid material and fabrication approach that extends the functionality of wood by integrating um, hygroscopic wood, wood actuators into the 3D printing process through robotic fabrication. And so we developed a large-scale additive manufacturing platform featuring an industrial robot with multiple end effectors, including a vacuum gripper here for the quick placement of the wood actuators as well as a large format um, extruder for the tailoring of 3D printed metamaterial structures. And um, this creates a biocomposite system, a uh, material system that is capable of an upscaled self-shaping. So because of the, um, the, the larger nozzle and the material cross-section that resulted from this transition from desktop to robotic scale, we had to develop a new extrusion tool path logic that was non-crossing but continuous and interwoven, as well as recalibrate the material programming properties, which um, can be tuned via the pattern depth, thickness, resolution, aspect ratio, and pattern geometry. And um, then this enables the physical programming areas with graded stretching, um, areas of high and isotropic stiffness, here, as well as areas of bending in different directions through the integrated with bilayer actuators. And these biocomposite structures that result are designed to transform from flat to curved by acclimating its moisture content to ambient conditions. And um, 
this uh, project resulted in a new type of adaptive structures, uh, adaptive structure that interacts with its environment simply through changes in the relative community. So as a, as a summary, um, I presented a framework for the computational design and material programming of 4D printed motion mechanisms and the transfer of multi-phase movements from biology to 4D printing that shows that we can expand the scope of biomimetic and bio-inspired design and also potentially allow us to achieve performance and properties beyond what is found in nature, as well as ups, uh, upscaling mesostructures to hybrid additive fabrication and biocomposite systems, demonstrating that bio-inspired structures and cell shaping can be achieved at large scale. And each of these findings um, have also been published in several venues, uh, including Advanced Science, Bio-Inspiration Biomedics, and the Symposium on Computational Fabrication. So I invite you to explore these papers if you are interested in this uh, topic. And in terms of future work, we're currently working on applying this um, research to architecture and construction in a building demonstrator that we will hopefully unveil this summer. But ultimately, I hope that my um, Doctoral research on material programming for 4D printing paves the way to a new type of thinking of dis about design, which considers objects like living things um, as a sequence of shapes and behaviors with functionally graded material properties. And, um, and I hope that this opens uh, the design space of further bio-inspired applications beyond what I have shown. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions during the discussion. Um, I look forward to, to that, but you're also welcome to reach out to me at my email listed here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tiffany. Um, so with that, we come to the last uh, presentation um, by Niklas, who also happens to be the PhD research, researcher who joined most recently, um, ICD, and I think there's another really exciting piece of work um, to be seen already at this stage, and uh, definitely some very, very interesting uh, future prospects. Are you ready, okay. Niklas? Yes, yes, uh, can Thank you hear me? You. Thank you, Akim. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'm a researcher also at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction at the University of Stuttgart. And I'm just going to very quickly present a high level overview of my work on AI for distributed robotic construction. Um, so here's some fun facts about me. Um, I just started the second year of my PhD, as Ahim just mentioned. Um, I did my bachelor in fine arts, um, then got my master's of science at the iTech program, um, like Sam and Jakob, um, uh, here at the University of Stuttgart. Um, I collaborate with Sam on a lot of our projects. Um, so consider the research that I'm about to present as more or less complementary to the work that he showed um, previously. Um, distributed construction refers to a set of agents that are capable of collectively building something together. So you might be familiar with such systems in the natural world, uh, like in termite or weaver ant colonies, uh, where mounds and nests emerge from the cooperative behavior of thousands or even millions of simple insects. Um, such systems are also very common in colony management video games, which are some of my favorites, um, like Age of Empires and Dwarf Fortress, where hundreds of NPCs will build a highly complex virtual world um, while adhering to a set of rules. So such systems are characterized uh, by a high level of cooperation, and uh, they're often performing tasks that no single agent could perform alone, and building structures that are much larger than the individual agents themselves. Now, similarly, in our field, distributed robotic construction refers to sets of small and mobile robots that collaborate to build large structures. And we are interested um, in these systems because they are particularly promising for automating on-site construction, um, which is a process whose innovation has been stagnant for decades and one of the least automated industries in the world. Um, this potential of distributed robotic systems for on-site construction is due to first their unlimited work envelope um, as they're not restricted to a static base uh, like cranes or robot arms and can thus climb on the structure potentially to an infinite uh, scale. Um, the resilience because they operate in large teams and have no single point of failure. So they can uh, easily replace faulty individuals 
um, adapt to any kind of external uh, disturbance. Um, and finally, their ability to co collaborate and cooperate uh, in large teams to perform increasingly complex tasks that no, uh, no individual machine could hope to perform alone. Um, now, however, much like the termites, the ants, the dwarves, and the NPCs from the uh, previous examples that I showed, in order to do this, our robots need to have uh, some kind of intelligence, right? So this intelligence uh, is artificially programmed. And in the context of real life construction, it entails the ability to first break down a given architectural design into a set of tasks. Uh, second, to decide on a logical sequence of actions that would accomplish those tasks. And third, to plan which geometric motions each robot will perform over time to execute those actions. So the trajectory generation. Um, um, this sort of AI falls under the field of task and motion planning, uh, which is one of the central aspects of my research. So in the next uh, slides, I'm going to give some examples of problems that we have tackled in this research area, uh, using as a case study our ongoing project of robotically building with uh, flexible bamboo combs. Um, in contrast to the project that Sam presented, where the building material is used as part of the robot body, right? It's like leveraged uh, as part of the kinematic system. This project uh, leverages the complex properties of the material, namely bamboo and its elasticity um, for use during the assembly tasks. Um, this project is uh, funded both by the, the NCDC Cluster of Excellence and the uh, Cyber Valley Research Fund. So to start off, press play here. Um, we're gonna talk about locomotion, um, which is one of the foundational actions involving, in, involved in executing uh, such construction processes. So locomotion involves the movements of robotic agents around the construction site. And this can either be on the ground, as in this video that I'm showing right now, or climbing on the structure itself. Um, we achieve this action to, uh, through two kinds of algorithms. Um, first, uh, like the video games that we talked about earlier, uh, we do path planning by performing a search of the existing construction site and finding a feasible path to the desired location, as you can see on the, on the GIF on the right. Um, then using kinematic solvers, we find the motion that the robot must execute to follow the waypoints found by the, the search algorithm and finally arrive at its destination. And you can see that as the little dance that's on the left side of the screen right now. Um, here's a video of a simple locomotion action being carried out on the real hardware of the, the first prototype of the robots for this project. Um, the robot, as you can see, will climb to the end of a bamboo element in order to um, arrive at another part of the structure while utilizing the material's uh, flexible um, properties. Um, another problem uh, that we must solve in distributed robotic construction is that of material transportation. And the action of transportation will usually entail the coordination of multiple robots so that a piece of building material can be moved from one location to another. Um, there's many strategies in achieving this, uh, depending on the kind of robotic system used. And pictured here uh, is the chaining strategy where robots organize themselves in a chain and then pass the material along until it reaches its final goal. Um, similar to locomotion, uh, this action involves uh, ser first searching for a path that the material can travel instead of a, a path where the robot can travel. And then we use kinematic solvers to find the sequence of configurations that allow the robots to pass the material amongst themselves. So it's similar to locomotion, except we're actually forming this, this essentially locomotion chain with multiple robots. Um, we started to explore the integration of this action in the hardware. Um, however, so far, we've only built one robot. We're in the process of building more. Um, so we were only able to conduct preliminary tests with um, um, a human collaborator. Now, this is when things start to get interesting. So when working with natural materials, uh, we must often solve nonlinear problems induced by irregular material properties. And such is the case when building with bamboo because of its elastic properties, right? And this video, you can see how a robot can swing rhythmically in order to bend a bamboo um, bundle into a desired position. Uh, when the tip of the bundle uh, reaches the desired position, another robot will grab it and secure it into place, right? Um, and how do we actually train the robots to be able to do this? I think this might answer one of the, one of the questions posted on YouTube um, a few minutes ago. Um, such a problem is highly nonlinear, so we actually use a different AI method to solve it uh, than the ones we use in locomotion and transportation. Here, we're actually um, training a neural network controller um, so that we can give the robots an understanding of the elastic behavior of the bamboo cones. 
um, and thus being able to control the, the material using the momentum generated by their movements. So we essentially do hours and hours of training in a simulated environment like this, um, so that we can train that controller to then, to then control the robots um, um, when it comes to, to doing the actual thing. And here, I wish these would just play automatically. Uh, these are the videos of the neural network actually being deployed on real hardware. And as we can clearly see, the robots have uh, developed an understanding from manipulating the bending of the bamboo, right? By generating uh, the momentum um, with their movements. On the left side, you see the horizontal bending, and on the right side, you see a vertical bending. Um, in future work, uh, we're going to explore uh, sequencing, which is which entails the transform, uh, transforming a geometric architectural design into a sequence of logical actions. Um, this is uh, particularly difficult because we need to take as an input a geometric description of an architectural design, transform this into a useful data structure like a graph uh, with nodes and edges, something we can actually perform computation on, um, then determine the dependencies between each node, um, so we know what order each node needs to be built in. And finally, determine a feasible sequence that the robot can follow. Um, this process is generally known as a task, gra task graph scheduling. Um, and I guess in, in, in general, it would involve uh, finding the feasible sequence, but also allocating the appropriate resources um, in that sequence, right? How many robots do we have? How much energy is that going to take, et cetera? Where's the material? Now, combining this ability to sequence with the abilities I described in the previous sections, would allow us to deploy a robotic construction system that's not only automated but also autonomous, meaning a degree of human intervention is low to non existent. Um, distributed robotic construction is still in its early uh, phases of research. Um, however, by implementing recent advances in AI, as I've shown, um, as well as uh, new hardware technologies, we're getting closer than ever to deploying these systems on site and building real architectural structures. Um, Thank you so much. And I will also be ready for questions uh, once we get to the discussion. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you, thank you all the presenters. They were remarkably interesting presentations. We have, um, just to say we have, um, we'll be taking questions from um, the YouTube and from um, Billy Billy. Um, uh, and so please, we have some questions already. Um, I, my colleague uh, Philip Yuan is 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 here. I'm just wondering whether Philip, you'd like to uh, uh, um, ask the first question, or whether you have anything to. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Achim. Long time no see. Uh, it's a wonderful time. Uh, we can um, uh, listen to all the uh, the PhD students from ICD, and uh, we can see uh, what's happening over the, the past two years because of COVID, it's, it's um, difficult to meet, meet each other for us. But I think it's, you, you really make a great progress. So firstly, I would like to thank a lot to uh, all the team from ICD and thanks a lot to Ahim. I think it's a great opportunity to the world uh, to see what ICD is, is, is uh, uh, what was research here is, is happening. And in China, I think right now on Bilibili, it's around 1,500 audience um, uh, in this lecture, in this special event. Uh, it's a great opportunity for, for us. And also, we we'll put we would like to put in the community. And I think it's a way, uh, still uh, during the COVID, it's, it's a way uh, ICD contributes to the whole world uh, and sharing uh, your research. Um, and uh, uh, my impression, actually, uh, because I make a great um, uh, discussion debate with 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 Neil, um, because right now um, um, uh, 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 artificial intelligence is really changing the whole design world. So um, Neil is right now he uh, uh, push a lot in the artificial intelligence, especially which is uh, immaterial intelligence. But uh, what we can see today, uh, still in ICD, I think um, uh, I really appreciate uh, your research. It's not just about the virtual uh, research in the generative progress uh, of architecture, but also we can see through the ro robotic and this kind of uh, um, autonomous um, construction tools, still you are testing some material intelligence uh, in the architecture world. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. 
Uh, from my uh, 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 my question, uh, uh, I would like to ask to Ahim because I can see a diagram which showing not only the fabrication and uh, not just about the material intelligence as you mentioned uh, 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 five years ago, but right now it's, it goes to the it's a systematic uh, thinking in the building industry, especially you are talking about the building technology and uh, including the details construction progress. Uh, I really interested in that part because I think um, over the past 10 years, uh, your team already make a huge progress and contributions to the world about the, what robotics can do in the future. But I think uh, right now, uh, uh, the most difficulty is still not testing the new, not just about testing the new possibility about intelligence part of the agency based uh, uh, um, uh, autonomous uh, agent in, 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 in architecture construction progress, but most importantly is how to engage into the construction progress. So I, I want to ask um, Akim, uh, what's your plan or your vision for the future of your research? Uh, how would you like to connect uh, your research to the architecture industry? Um, um, and um, and what uh, your uh, advanced research will lead to a um, uh, 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 possibility of construction or will will have a strong connection to the to the architecture industry. So that's my question to Akim. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you. Um, I think uh, maybe there are two um, parts to your questions, or there are also two parts to my answer. One is that we have understood um, that uh, we need to tackle, let's say, the potential of digital technologies comprehend more comprehensively. Um, and I think that's why we have sort of coined this notion of co-design, where we really try to um, relate the realm of design and engineering methods which tend to happen more in the computational and the virtual domain um, with um, the building and material systems that ultimately give rise to a new kind of architecture through the fabrication construction processes that we're researching. And we're trying um, to look at these six domains current currently so that they inform each other. And um, I think that the uh, goal is, and I think you've seen that in all six presentations, um, I think in one way or another. And I think the goal really is to, of course, have an impact on how we physically construct um, the world. Now. So how we, how we really um, produce architecture, um, which I think in the case of the, what Christoph and uh, Jakob, for example, have shown, um, is something that we have already managed to uh, transfer to a degree um, to architectural projects. Um, and uh, we're also very much looking forward. I think Tiffany alluded to this uh, autonomous building scheme that we are currently, actually, Yaz is also involved in this, uh, will implement in an architectural project. Um, uh, hopefully this year. And um, of course, we're also seeking opportunities to then see how distributed robotics may have an impact on, on, on architecture. But I think that um, for us is always, uh, I think, uh, to really see how computation and materialization coexist and how both facets need to be co-designed. And I think that's maybe also, uh, let's say, the architectural desire in, in the research. OK, thank you. You. Yeah, can I well, ask I just for, thank, thank you, it's great to see you here. Um, I, I've got a question, we actually have a question in, in the chat, which is in some part been, been answered uh, by Nicholas's presentation. Um, uh, uh, what kind of role does artificial intelligence play in any of your fabrication processes? Do you train robots to allow them to learn certain particular tasks? Um, I should say that we, uh, we have a, an issue of architectural design um, coming out in, uh, I think, uh, the 1st of June, uh, that Matthias Del Campo and I have guest edited, and uh, Thomas Fortman and, and Akim have contributed an article to that, uh, which is, we'll, we'll explain in some way, um, but of course, Nicholas has, has been showing this work. I, I've got a question for Nicholas, because I think this was really intriguing work that you were um, presenting. Um, 
My question is this: How do you how are you able to locate your robots in in three dimensions? How do do they know exactly where they are? I mean, it seems a lot quite. I mean, incredibly. I mean, it's full of potential, but quite. Um, let's say uh, uh, optimistic in terms of its control system. How do they locate themselves in three dimensional space? Um, Henio, uh, thanks for the question. So that's that's a, a very good question, and actually one of the big challenges I think, right, in in, in actually implementing the distributed robotics on site. Um, currently, um, from the work that you actually saw, uh, it was kind of a low budget thesis work at that point. So the robots we were using actually some Vive equipments, right, to localize them. Um, now we've upgraded that system from just a, a commercial like uh, everyday Vive uh, lighthouses to a big opti track uh, cage, right? So we actually have like um, quite a bit of space to localize them in. But I actually have quite a bit of faith in in developing the future uh, computer vision to do localization uh, because there's uh, some some pretty interesting advances in that right now. Um, and also uh, using, uh, I guess, the, the material as a way to localize yourself as well, right? So we always we always try to look, I think, uh, externally for localization, but I think there's actually a really big opportunities of, of actually grabbing the material, understanding where you're at, looking up, looking down, you know, just the way that, you know, an organism would. Okay, great. Um, maybe uh, there's a question here for Yassi in the, in the chat. Um, could you please comment on the notion of time of these adaptive material structures? What is the time range that you're able to program? Yassi? Um, well, that uh, varies with the material and also the uh, mesostructural uh, properties that I try to explain. But the range is something in between minutes to days. You can say um, starts with like 20, 25 minutes, and it can be extended until 48 hours to 72 hours. So it's a wide range that we can uh, program the time scale. But I mean, can you be very precise about it, or is it uh, in terms of calibration or? Uh... Um, yeah. So so okay, we can't make it. Um, it's not easy to get them fast. So kind of the fastest motion that we get is around twenty to twenty five minutes uh, in response to humidity. Around five to ten minutes in response to water. Um, but then by increasing the thickness, for example, by decreasing the porosity and by adding a blocking layer, we can um, extend it to one or two hours or multiple hours up until three days. This is what we tested until now. Great. Well, there's, a, there's another question in the chat, um, which is to do with the natural materials um, that were presented. Could you provide more details for this process? For example, fireproof. I assume the question then is about how do you fireproof national materials? And I think that question is, is it for Christoph? Um, uh, I think so, yes. Yes. Um, so um, I don't know if we can, if we, if we can uh, talk about that in, in such a general way. So, because um, natural materials, they, there are many of them and they have different properties. Um, there are several particularities when it comes to the uh, to integrating them into the process, like in fabrication and uh, the way they absorb resin, um, the way they are pulled by the robot because they have a low tensile strength. Um, for fire safety, uh, most organic fibers and polymer matrices uh, will decompose when they're exposed to high temperatures. And um, there are like two approaches to increase the fire resistance. So. Um, by either uh, increasing the resistance of the matrix, so of the resin, or by reinforcing the, or and by reinforcing the fibers, or by providing a protective coating, and uh, both include uh, the use of fire retardants to kind of slow down the uh, composite decomposition, the heat release, the flame spread, and um, that's a very active field of research, like on its own within the realm of material science and. There are bio-based resins which uh, comply with aircraft, marine, and rail fire performance requirements. And um, what we are most uh, interested in is to uh, identify the uh, best suited candidates of fiber and, uh, and, and resin to um, adapt to our fabrication system so that we can, we can use them uh, in coalesced filament binding to build our uh, architectural structures with those uh, material systems. 
Thanks, Christopher. There's a question in the chat that's actually directed towards the PhD candidates, but maybe Akin is in a better position to to answer this question. And I want to get and catch Akin before he has to go because he has to leave fairly soon. Uh, and it says, my question to the PhD candidates, what is your strategy in submitting a PhD proposal? Could you pr uh, provide any advice on things that you would do differently in pursuing an interdisciplinary PhD research? How do you navigate the mismatch, misalignment between your research ambition and your individual skills? I don't know whether that's a question, but it's also about Akim. How do you fit uh, this, these individuals within the framework of the, the projects at large? Um, well, maybe it's a question for Akim, but also for the students. Maybe Akim, you'd like to comment on that. Okay, um, I think it also relates to one of the questions that uh, uh, came up later in the chat. And I think, um, I think what what uh, what we do is uh, we um, actually advertise all vacant PhD positions um, so that anyone has a chance to apply. And then I think my responsibility is to match individual interests with the kind of research opportunities that we have at the institute so that exactly that conflict does not arise and typically the way this unfolds is that and i think that would be interesting to hear now from from the other perspective of course is that um the uh there's i would say an initial one year period where you're where these kind of mutual um let's say interests begin to converge into one uh, research undertaking and um, I think in most cases, I think we've managed to not even have this conflict of individual interest and research agenda. I think the idea is always that these things are fully aligned. That's why um, I think I take uh, quite uh, great care um, to select candidates so that um, this can, can really happen. No? And I think, um, uh, I, I hope that in most cases, you know, it unfolds in a kind of uh, productive and uh, successful manner. That's that's my role in, in it. But I think it would be interesting to hear also from from some of you guys uh, how how you feel whether there is even such a conflict or uh, or not. Maybe I can just ask you: Do, do most of your your um, PhD candidates come through the master's program first of all? Do they all come through that, or not necessarily? No, ah, maybe one thing that I also want to say, because I think we uh, at the University of Stuttgart, we don't consider our PhDs to be students, we consider them to be researchers. So they have actually a high level of PhD researchers. So they have a high, quite a high level, I would say, of uh, independency, but also a high level of responsibility. So it's not so much a curated program where a lot of things are set in stone. But actually, um, what we do typically after one year or a bit more time is that we have an agreement, yeah? literally a PhD agreement, where the way how the PhD will unfold over the next period, over the next few years, is actually written down, and then also um, how this will, let's say, lead to certain research outcome. And I think this is a very, I think for the German context, surprisingly flexible, open-ended and adaptive process that I think um, leaves, uh, let's say, the freedom for exploration while at the same time giving some kind of structure that of course is required to pursue an interdisciplinary research project which comes with a work program, milestones, et cetera. Yeah, Ahim, I have something to add. I think, um... It's a great PhD program um, in ICD, and uh, I think uh, we'll be uh, we'll be very happy if ICD can set up some um, collaboration uh, collaborative um, uh, program. For example, uh, Hua, Cai Hua, uh, uh, he uh, will spend one year uh, in ICD, give, give him really uh, great support. Uh, he just passed the final defense of his PhD thesis. I think uh, he really appreciate uh, uh, your support uh, for the exchange PhD program. So we are looking forward, if possible, uh, to have more collaboration, uh, give more op opportunity to some PhD candidates uh, to, to give us some exchange program. Uh, I think you'll be appreciated for that. Uh, or uh, maybe uh, right now it's difficult for traveling, but um, uh, Neil and me, we're, we're 
working uh, to launch a, 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 a journal named Architecture Intelligence. So also we send you um, an invitation uh, to um, uh, contribute because you have a, a very good research teams um, to, to the uh, community. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, have more collaboration with, with you. And actually what's happening here in Shanghai uh, over the past two years, uh, we set up a robotic research center in Shanghai downtown around 10,000 square meters. So that is under construction and uh, really going uh, very well. And uh, we, we focus more on the uh, con construction industry. So also we can um, um, give some um, uh, opportunity if uh, you want to test uh, 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 all kinds of possibility in the construction progress, can we can set up more collaboration with each other. So really uh, thanks to uh, the uh, sharing uh, your research and, and also at the same time, we are looking forward to, ha to have more collaboration with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I don't know if you can still hang, hold on for any longer or, or whether you need to go, but I just wanted to thank you for putting this together. It's been a really fascinating insight, exactly what I thought everybody would be interested in. And the response, the fact that there are so many on Billy Billy watching is I think a, a great uh, validation of the kind of research that you're doing. And it's certainly been very interesting for, I think also for other researchers around the world who often operate in isolation to be able to share a platform where they can see what other people are doing. So it's exactly what Digital Futures ultimately was, was intended to be about. So it's it's fantastic. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I wonder if we could get, this, get your, 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 your PhD, what was the word, uh, researchers uh, to um, to comment on that earlier question about uh, about negotiating their individual aspirations and the, and the projects going on. Does anyone want to contribute to that kind of question? About, uh, or maybe not with that. <laughs> Maybe that's a good good moment for me. I, I really, unfortunately, I have to leave because I have to give another lecture at five. But maybe it's even better and you get a more interesting <laughs> conversation in my absence. So on that thank, note, thank, thank, thanks a lot thank for you, Akin. Thank, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Akin. Thank you, Akin. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, let's... I mean, uh, I, let, uh, Sam, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, I maybe have some thoughts. I mean in terms of this like mismatch in between research ambition and individual skills. I mean, I came from the iTech master's program. So, um, but I think a lot of us like, uh, of course apply to be at the ICD. So we kind of have an expectation of like what the work is going to be and, and what the skills maybe um, um, are required for that. Um, but I think what maybe all of us I hope can agree on is is we all work in interdisciplinary projects and actually like this takes a lot of kind of learning and figuring out right i think like most of us are trained in kind of one discipline and negotiating like teams and figuring out like where your research ambition lies in a team has been like definitely something um that we've all or i for sure needed to learn um and i think there's definitely space for that right like space for learning while doing the PhD, we definitely have like whether that's for this example, or like learning some new technology and things like this, like we lead our own seminars and courses for the master students, I think, like and and listen to each other and the team is actually like quite big as often presented in the beginning. So like there's opportunities to kind of pick up your skills also when you kind of enter the, the PhD from um, the colleagues in the institute. Yeah, maybe I can also speak um, a little bit about that now that I'm done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I actually came uh, not from the iTech program. I think three of us here, um, uh, Jakob, Sam, Nicholas are from the iTech program and myself, Yassi and Christopher, uh, you know, were hired externally. Um, so I think, um, of course, like, coming into the ICD and um, everyone in the first year, I would say, is not going to be uh, so clear on what their um, contribution is, right, um, in their PhD. It takes, I would say that it takes some time to, to hone that. Even if you have a very good, solid proposal when you come in, um, it's, it's always gonna evolve inevitably. <laughs> 
So it's really important to, I think, keep that in mind that um, this is something like based on your findings, um, it's to be open to this, uh, this change. Uh, but also, I think that uh, in my case, I work a lot with, um, in, in terms of the mismatch between your skills and um, your topic, I think it's really important that you uh, also realize that in, in a PhD uh, research, that you're not trying to be very wide in your uh, contribution, right? Like you are trying to find, go very deep into your niche and um, explore and advance science in that particular area. So um, I think that's maybe something that a lot of new PhD researchers um, have trouble with is to understand that it's not about like, being good at everything, but it, to really uh, discover what it is that you are able to contribute based on your unique skill sets. And, um, and I, I also am working very closely with um, biologists, uh, the plant biomechanics group at Freiburg University. So um, that has been a really fruitful relationship um, for me because I am very interested in, um, I mean, I have a very deep fascination with um, plant um, biomechanics and I, I don't have that uh, background. So, so I'm very lucky, lucky that I get to work with um, you know, very renowned researchers in that, uh, in that area and, um, yeah, and understand that, you know, they have their areas and I have mine, but, but we can really, um, uh, I don't know, I guess discover <laughs> the research together, um, in a very collaborative and fruitful way. Does anyone else want to comment on that? We have some other questions in the chat as well. Um, maybe let's move on to some of the questions in the chat. There's one which I think is an important one but from um, Marie Davidova. Um, could you elaborate further on how you integrate social systems in your research? Now, my assumption is it's a bit like the Bauhaus in the sense that the technology is always seen as inscribed within a kind of uh, the so within a sort of social uh, um, logic, and it has this. I, I think the, your your interest in say uh, sustainability is part of that. But maybe um, one of you might like to comment on um, in, engaging with social systems in your research. Or maybe that's a tough question. Um, yeah, maybe I can. Um, uh, sorry, Sam. Now I cut you off. Did you? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and. Then... I'll keep myself short. I guess, I guess this is a super relevant question. I think we also um, appreciate the connection between computational design, robotic fabrication, with this kind of uh, more overarching questions more and more. Um, and I think what we, especially what, what we can see with like massive uh, kind of funding also going into the space for let's say, uh, big startups, um, I, think, I think it's really relevant to, to, to ask the question um, who we're actually developing all these tools for, right? Um, and I think this is also, um, at least in my view, part and parcel of this kind of notion of co-design that, that actually the, the, the target of just automating the design process, right? And just generating um, design solutions um, within a, a paradigm of automation is really is really not the the main point uh, at least at least for my research anymore. Um, but rather the, the the question is how you can actually interact with with all those systems, right? And how you enable, uh, let's say, communities and societies and cities, right, to to really come up with with their own answer to a certain uh, design problem uh, using those technologies, right? Which is, I think, on a, on a very fundamental question, something that, that at least in, in manufacturing, where a lot of those uh, technologies are coming from, it's, it's really not, that, that question doesn't play a role at all there, right? Um, because um, the design of a car doesn't have the same social uh, replica, uh, replications as a as a build, uh, as a as a building project in the middle of a city that is basically a public kind of um, uh, project rather than a personal item right 
And I, th I think this is, I guess, I guess maybe we're just scratching the surface on that kind of uh, thinking uh, at the moment, but, uh, but I think that's going to be more and more relevant, especially if you're trying to apply those uh, those tools and technologies in the in a, in a sustainable fashion in, in the industry. We have a question from Zhuo Zhang in the, in the chat. Um, the research about fiber and timber is fascinating. I think the whole thing presentation was really fascinating. Is ITEC program and ICD now or in the future interested in geometric malleability like concrete or steel 3D printing? No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I, I well, don't, actually, we have, we have one. Well, we yeah. Uh, yeah, we have one researcher that is doing concrete, but it's really an exception at the moment. Samuel, yeah, I was just gonna say what Jakob just said. Now, I mean, there's interest in concrete in other institutes. Um, in our in CDC kind of research cluster, we work together with one institute called ILEC that does a lot of research on con concrete. Um, but from our perspective, I, I think 3D printing, of course, is, is like as Tiffany and, and Yazi kind of work on. Um, but I think concrete is less so our expertise and not really on our research agenda for the most part. I, I would just make one comment and that is that uh, Akim famously taught Neri Oxman, and uh, she's no longer running a, a, a lab at MIT Media on, on mediated matters. So there is space for that. Um, uh, maybe I could ask the question here for, for, for you, Sam, and for Nicholas. Um, would you consider a human in the loop? What would be the advantages of a post-human team? Hmm. Um. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think uh, from my perspective, I, will, I think also Nicholas is, we still consider a human in the loop, right? Like maybe that's not super explicit, but like we want to have a designer, right? On the team of like, and we want to have a, a human involved in, in that design process in, in that respect, like making design decisions. Um, and I mean, I think also like a, a bit more insight is right. These these systems that we are developing are still like um, in the works, in progress, and I think like therefore there there the requires like technicians and um, oversight of the systems that um, um, definitely like requires um, still a human to be involved. Yeah, I think just to, to clarify something I also said in my presentation is that autonomy we see it more as like a, a, a we'll say a gradient in the scale of automation right it's not like something once it becomes autonomous it, it functions all by itself especially in our field um, i would say that that as you decrease the the um the uh level of of interaction with humans you get something that is more autonomous right but i think it's also really important to to take a step back and consider what sam said about not not necessarily that being our goal right we're not trying to completely remove the humans from the loop but maybe trying to figure out where where their inputs and uh, uh where their input would be most valuable right maybe we could we, there's another question for you nicholas uh, sorry to put you on the spot um it, okay. it's in the fun. chat are you considering exploring different curvature of bamboo units depending on self weight of the robots or their location on the bamboo unit question mark tackling z axis z axis growth question mark um i'm okay let me i see the question here so we are definitely i guess okay so we're, we're exploring right now different species of bamboo right different sizes and things like this which we haven't so much explored in the past and we're slowly noticing that as as we grow in scale right not having these small structures but something uh, large and actually monolithic um you end up not needing so much of the swinging behavior right but actually distributing the weight of robots on a large structure um so i think in in that regards uh we we are kind of exploring also i guess uh moving away from uh less precise simulation and and more precise uh i guess distribution of weights to actually make the structure form form into something right 
I'm not exactly sure what the uh, z-axis growth uh, part of that question refers to. Um, so I don't know how to, how to say that, um, but uh, yeah. But maybe that's in reference to like the bamboo growing itself and like, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, it's something we also kind of talked about, right? In, in some points of the project that like, maybe if the material is also like growing and changing, like you can use that in, in, in the process. Like, but I think this is kind of also very kind of future looking in terms of the research. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of science fiction, and I would say, like, you know, if, if we're talking about you know, very far in the future of this research, I'd love to have a set of these robots for actually farming the bamboo, right? And then a set of the a set who's actually assembling it. Um, but that might be the science fiction uh, fan of me. <laughs> maybe I can just um, bring bring Yassi in again. Um, maybe Yassi, you'd like to say something about the the role of humans in your systems and and workflows. Um, yeah, of course. Um, well, I think for for our research um, on the shape changing systems, we actually see the role of human like both as like human as being a designer and fabricator or human as the user. Um, so for like human as designer and fabricator, we um, we develop this interfaces, I think both in mine and in Tiffany's presentation. Um, basically the interface is that, that lets one intuitively design the shape changing structures and then the 3D printing um, processes, the tool pass and the G code is automatically generated. So it simplifies the process, process a lot for a designer. Um, so that is basically like one part of our research that we uh, develop these like workflows and actually you can find uh, some of them in our publications. And um, another aspect would be a human as the user, which is something that we would, um, we are now looking into and will probably hopefully come up in our future projects is that if the shape changing systems do not only respond to the outside condition and to the environment, but they can also be added to an additional a uh, level of control that can be then controlled by the human users. And that's definitely one of the areas that we will explore uh, further in the future. So I think um, this would be how human really is involved in our <laughs> uh, world. <laughs> We've got, I, th I will try and wrap this up fairly soon because I know that it's very late for Philip Yuan in, 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 in China. It's has gone midnight there. Um, but there's one question for Nicholas. You seem to be very popular today, Nicholas. Um, uh, and it's, a, I, again, I think a question you're going to challenge it to answer. How do you deal with um, the condition of the bamboo, especially if you get damage from worms and things like that? From a, a question from Yung Yan Ma. I would love to say that we are working on an AI to detect the worms and get them out. Um, but at that process of the, I guess this maybe is a good way to relate to the previous question. I would say the process of inspection of materials and things like this are still and very much in the human side. And the work is mostly focusing on the assembly of we'll say pre-screen materials, right? Um, however, uh, I will say that, for example, if, if a bamboo breaks or maybe like the fibers bend somehow, right? In a way that they're not supposed to, now that would be a really interesting um we'll say like auxiliary ai to have for that kind of detection right if the bamboo is suddenly not not swinging the way that is expected anymore then there's probably some kind of structural failure that can be maybe identified and then um and then addressed i, I think there are a series of other questions coming in for you about whether you can train your robots to to learn about um that's one more. Uh, what kind of role does AI play? Okay, so that uh, do you train robots to allow them to learn certain particular tasks? Is it a learning process? I guess it must be, right? So yeah, so the, the swinging is a learning process. So we, we use different kinds of AI, we'll say, like right in this uh, in the task and motion planning. Um, the, we use machine learning, right? And specifically reinforcement learning for the robot to train the robots to, to understand the, the swinging, right? Because that's a very nonlinear kind of task to, to understand. But we also uh, implement other AI um, techniques, like for example, in locomotion or transportation, where maybe there's less there's less variability in the task, right? Then we focus more on on decision making AI. Um, we actually use logic geometric programming 
um, because we collaborate a lot with um, some researchers in Berlin, uh, Mark Dussant's uh, lab up in Berlin. Um, so it, 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 the, the AI method used for each task, we'll say, um, is really dependent on that task, right? It's not like we're trying to force, and I think it's actually an issue which arises when there's so much excitement about machine learning in particular, is that people will try to cram all problems into a machine learning like framework. They try to cast it like that, when in fact, it's not a, a solve all, right? It's not like a, a solve all black box. So um, I guess being, being aware of which AI method to use for which problem you're trying to solve is, is really important. I, I think it'd be, it'd be good. We should try and wrap up now. This has been an absolutely fascinating session, uh, really fascinating. Um, I'd like to just invite Philip, if you'd like to make a, um, a, a final comment uh, before we wrap up. Philip, would you, do you have a yeah. comment to say? <clears throat> it's, it's my honor to, uh, to spend uh, this amazing time here. Um, although it's already midnight, but still we have a lot of people uh, audit in this uh, uh, wonderful uh, lecture series. So thanks a lot to ICD team. I think uh, you are the best um, in the world and uh, leading the, the whole discipline going on. So I would like to thanks to your contribution to the architecture dis uh, community. So looking forward uh, to see what's happening uh, of your research and um, uh, looking forward that you can uh, support uh, Digital Futures in the future. And also uh, we uh, launched the Archite uh, Arch Architecture Intelligence uh, new journal and uh, looking forward to your contribution. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you so much. So yes, thanks. I think you set the bar very high, you guys. Um, <laughs> we're going to find out, I think, in the next uh, few months whether you are the leading institution. We the, we're just putting together a session with um, uh, MIT Media Lab, um, which will be a, an interesting contrast in, in many ways. But I must say, I, I this was one of my ideas to do this and to get a kind of fly on the wall view of what's going on inside the institution in terms of the individual research, because we do see these amazing pavilions, these kind of end products, but there's a lot of research that's going on. It's a bit like an iceberg in some senses, you can see on the top, but all this research, individual research is really incredibly powerful and impressive. I do think um, sets a very high standard. So I'd like to congratulate you for that. I, I just want to mention that we're, we're working on a series of these things and uh, hopefully uh, we'll try and get through many of them. Well, several, several different institutions to get an overview, but it's really, I think, a hugely interesting insight into what your guys are doing and uh, uh, hopefully be useful also for the individual researchers that are a part of that. So um, watch this space and we, we are planning for March to have another session to follow up. Um, I want to also just mention that tomorrow we get a session on, on intelligence itself. We're looking at the question about intelligence, uh, looking at the, the kind of this curious inter interface between the world of, of, of neuroscience and AI and how this emerging theory of intelligence, which is really an incredibly powerful thing that goes alongside this very um, pragmatic approach towards the intelligent behavior that you, you, you guys are looking at. So um, I, I also want to say, to, in terms of icebergs, I want to thank the team here. I mean, there is a huge amount of work that goes on behind the behind the scenes. Um, uh, I want to thank Bavlin especially, who's been, been um, uh, who's been uh, live streaming this um, and all the team for putting together the promotional materials and so on. It's, a, it's an incredible, generous act that everyone's making, giving their time for free to contribute uh, and to share their passion for architecture. So I just want to thank uh, all our team today, all the six from ICD for sharing your individual passions um, about the projects you're working on. It was a very, very powerful uh, session. We will be uploading this to our YouTube library along with everything else we do and uh, to be a, to, that is available for uh, as a free resource for, for architects and students across the world. So thank you so much for, to everyone and uh, we will see you next week. Um, we uh, also will have a session tomorrow and uh, we will be over the weeks as well um, promoting further language sessions. We have an Arabic language session coming up, also a Farsi one yesterday, a Spanish one, and we're going to introduce Portuguese uh, in the next few weeks. So it's it, we're developing going forward and we look forward also to the summer to the big um, festival, shall we say, of workshops and, and the conference that uh, we are just in the process of organizing right now. So 
um, that will be coming up as well. So thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you in his absence to Akim, who always inspires and is always so organized and polished. And the work today was really fantastic. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you also, Philip. Thank you. Thank you.